Hello everyone, welcome to Green Drink Scale first live training event in year 2021. Today, we are going to talk about impactful photography for documenting and highlighting environmental issues. So I'm Jason, nice to meet every one of you. Today, I'm one of the moderators for today's event. So enjoy and let's welcome my partner, Simpson. Hi Jason, thank you very much. All Hi right. Simpson, so how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Jason, I hope you are good as well. Okay. All right. Nice. Okay. So uh, for those who are joining Green Drink Scale for the first time, so Green Drink Scale is a, what is it, an informal networking event for the environmental, uh, environmental conscious people. So um, in the past, we have been doing it in, let's say, restaurants and, and, and uh, like other places. So it is like informal sharing sessions. But now it is COVID season, so we do it online. So, well, since it is an uh, online session now, it is, uh, it is broadcast live in our face uh, Green Drink Scale Facebook. So, if you have any comments or if you have any questions, just drop, in, uh, drop your comments in the comment section. Uh, and also, uh, we will actually uh, get back, I mean, get, uh, ah, we, we, we will answer those questions during the Q&A session. And Green Drink Scale is usually uh, held two months once. So today it is uh, the title is impactful photography. The next event it will be it could be uh, we are working on the EV, uh, the electric vehicle. So yeah, uh, right. Okay. Thanks, Simpson. So for today's event, uh, the word impactful photography might be some a little confusing for others, but it actually means very simple. The impactful is actually means is it powerful enough to gain the audience attention? So once we take a photo. Is it powerful enough to gain others' attention? That's the word impactful means. So uh, in Malaysia, just one year ago, and in around February, a month before MCO, uh, there's a photojournalist named Sheka. He took a photo of the uh, orange asli children playing around the, uh, the landfill. So when this picture is uh, captured and post in the social media, so it gains so many people attention. So this photo is able to be very impactful and it able to bring up the society carings and even government action, immediate action for the children's safety. So we hope after today, we hope more people is able to take impactful photography as common practice. So uh, today we are welcoming Stuart Taylor He's a passionate photographer. He's been taking photo uh, images since 40 years ago. And there's a fun fact about him. He's been in Malaysia for 30 years. That's really elder than me. Maybe he's no more place Nasi Lama than me. <laughs> okay. So he's the founder of photograph, uh, Highlander Images Photography. Uh, this Highlander Images Photography is uh, uh, in the professional website based on Asia. Uh, he been Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and more place in Asia. So the first time I went through his album, uh, some place in Malaysia also, like Mountain Kinabalu, uh, Mountain Kiara, Bukit Kiara, Clan Gate, Bridge Rogers, it's just so stunning. I can't uh, rip my attention from it. So if you are interested for his artwork, you may search the link uh, below. So Let's welcome Stuart Taylor to our shows. Hi, everyone. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Stuart, uh, can you let our audience know how you get into the photography? Um, well, as you rightly say, I've been doing it for a very, very long time. Um, it goes back to when I was a child. My great aunt actually gave me an old camera, um, an old box camera, film camera, which I went out and played with and then just got interested and passionate about photography. And since that time, I've been taking photographs. Wow, that's really wonderful. I hope I, I got some good uncle to pass me some, uh, to take photos since young, but I, I I don't have the chance. <laughs> <laughs> now now you you have phone, okay, Jason. <laughs> oh yes yes yes. 
All right. So, Stuart, I uh, just wondering why Malaysia out of so many countries? Well, I was I was working directly in the oil industry, and um, that brought me out to Asia. Um, firstly, it was Singapore, and then spent quite a few years in the region, and ultimately ended up in Malaysia as a kind of central base. And as you rightly say, I've been here a long, long time, um, <laughs> longer than some of you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true, very true. <laughs> All right, okay. So thanks, thanks, to it uh, for those. And uh, well, without further ado, um, perhaps uh, let let us uh, pass the screen to you, the screen time to you. Okay. Uh, we, we can't wait for your sharing. That's great. Thank you very much. So let me let me just kick off this. Um, show here and um, take you through a few examples of um, some photographs which I hopefully will demonstrate will give some high impact and give you some tips and tricks and um, just show you some examples of that. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to um, both you Simpson and Jason and the rest of the Green Drinks KL team for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity. Um, to do this presentation. So the, the name of the presentation, um, I've called it Impact. So um, really it's talking about how to create high impact photographs, particularly in this case for documenting environmental issues because that is the key focus um, of the group here. Um, and many of you, in this group will be aware of the term environmental impact and um, really defined as any change to the environment and that could be a good change it could be a, it's usually referring to a bad change resulting from um, a facilities activities products or services and really in other words it's the effect that people's actions have on the environment and unfortunately we do see many bad demonstrations of that around the globe and this particular picture here was taken in Malaysia of course and we've seen a lot of cases here of deforestation taking place. So you're all familiar with environmental impact but what we're going to talk about today is photographic impact and really what I want to focus on is, is how you can create an image that has a particularly strong effect or a direct influence on the viewer. We want to grab somebody's attention and um, get them involved in the subject. And how do we actually do that? Um, photography, as we know, is, is very much used as a tool in um, documentaries and news and is used as a tool of proof in many cases. And as you rightly pointed out in the introduction, there's journalistic images very much have the power to persuade people about particular issues, whether it be war, environment, or whatever. And a perfect example is that classic picture of the Chinese man in Tiananmen Square standing in front of the tank. And that photograph was, was winged around the world and created an incredible reaction. So that some, some photographs like that can have an incredible amount of power. And photographs, visual information, photographs are understood and retained by us much more easily than written text. So just some of the topics I'm going to be discussing today. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to talk about how to actually create photographs with impact, to impact your environmental issue or any particular issue you're trying to document. Um, I'm going to talk about and show some example photo stories a bit later in the presentation. And then I'll touch a little bit on just a few bits of advice on how to plan and execute a photo shoot. Um, a little bit about post processing, preparing images for publication. There won't be a great deal on that because I mean, my whole philosophy is to keep it as simple as possible and do as little as possible to the photograph in post-processing. Uh, I'll touch on a few tips and tricks and then we're going to finish off today's presentation with the announcement of the photography competition winners which was being run over the last week. 
So how do we create photographs with impact? I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of different things as listed here, and we'll go through these a bit of a time. And as I go through that, I'm just going to be flicking through some examples of photographs, which will hopefully, hopefully demonstrate that. So let's first of all talk about creativity and imagination. And here's a photograph of mine, which shows a little bit of creativeness and doing something a little bit differently. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, as a photographer, you need, to be, you need to be very confident in what you're doing. Don't do everything that everybody else is doing. Don't copy them. Be inspired. Um, be prepared to break the rules. Um, that you've read all about various photography rules, but also be prepared to break them. And this is a perfect example of that, where I've broken a fairly basic rule of this photograph is, is blurred uh, and it looks out of focus. But I think it captures the essence of what I was trying to show here. This, this photograph was taken in um, Kyoto in Japan. And uh, this was a geisha or I don't know if it's a geisha or a Michael lady running very quickly down the street. So I think that really kind of captured the, the whole essence of what I saw in that street with very, very fast movement. So that's a slightly different technique to use. This is, this is another photograph I took quite a number of years ago and um, using, um, I did double processing. It was two separate images I took and basically superimposed one another, one with the hands on the face and one with the hands off the face. Um, this lady, some of you might even recognize who this is. Um, I met her many years ago at an Eco Warriors event at Stephanie Lai, and it was very, very uncanny, strange, that she actually posted this photograph today on her Facebook page just by chance, and I was using it as an example in this presentation. So that, that's a, as an example of doing different types of processing to really bring out and um, create a little bit of impact. Um, be prepared as well to use humour. Uh, I mean, we've all seen while we're walking around uh, taking photographs, you'll see a humorous sign, a humorous uh, event or something happening. Um, it's good to capture that and it grabs somebody's attention. Importantly, I think it's, it's, it's good to develop your own brand, your own theme of what you're trying to get over and create a mood or a message in your photographs to try and convey the particular message. Second thing I'd like to talk about is um, probably one of the most basic things in photography is light. Uh, light is fundamental to photography and we need to be aware that um, there's all different types of light and you need to be familiar with those different types of light and how to handle it. This, this is a photograph taken in Westlake, Hangzhou, in China very early in the morning. So here we see a very, very soft blue light, which is very familiar early in the morning. So that is a usually sometimes a very good time to get a lovely soft image. Similarly, this photograph here, which was taken in the fjords of Chile, Again, this was very early in the morning, but as a different light, it, it looked as though the, the sky was almost on fire and um, creates quite a high impact uh, of that sky on the whole image. And of course, we're all familiar with sunsets. Sunsets provide you with that dark, red, subtle colors. And again, evening time can be a very, very good time to, to do your photography, whereas midday, it, the, the light is usually very, very harsh. So you need to be aware of the source of light and the direction of the light as well. And the time of day uh, is of great importance. This, this, this photograph here is taken in my home country. It's a small seaside village in Scotland. And this is a, it's, it's a nice photograph. It's a, there's a lovely sky, nice light on the town, but just, a slightly different time, you can see the difference on that same view can be incredibly dramatic. 
So choosing the time for your photograph is extremely important. Windows as well, uh, I call it windows are my friend. Windows are a great source of light. Uh, this, this example here is taken in the Jade Emperor Pagoda in Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And this little pagoda or temple has a fantastic wooden slatted ceiling. And you can see here the rays of the sun coming in and um, blending in with the smoke coming up from the incense being burned. So you get an incredibly good effect here. So it's always good to take note of where windows are and use them. This is another example where we see our window um, backlighting a particular subject in front of a, uh, another. This is another uh, Buddhist temple over in um, Sabah, actually. Um, so we've talked a little bit about light. Composition is obviously very important, and I'll just show you a few examples of how to compose a photograph and maybe some of the things to consider while, while to do that. And it's really about how you want to frame that image. And you should really give great concern of what's going to be included in that image, in that little window, in your camera, and what's going to be excluded. And it's always good to try and reduce clutter, wait for the right moment and get the right things in the image and concentrate on the subject at hand. This is an example, and this is taken locally here in the rice fields of Sikinchan up on the west coast. And you'll see how I've composed the image here because this particular little set of photographs was all about the rice fields. I've really predominantly focused the image Three quarters of it, you'll see, is the actual rice fields. I've got the horizon about three quarters of the way up the image, really focusing in on the subject at hand, which is the rice fields. Uh, again, this is taken in the same, exactly the same location, but this time I wanted to focus on that beautiful cloud display in the sky. So you'll see I've actually framed the photograph with the bulk of the photograph being the sky because that is the main subject and that's where I want your eyes to be attracted to. So it's, it's key to focus on the subject that you want to highlight on. Again, this is an image which I've really taken a fairly dramatic effect here of really focusing in on the sky. There's only a very small sliver of the horizon at the bottom. This is in the high plains of Tibet on the train going towards Lhasa. But the sky was really so spectacular, I wanted to really focus on that particular part of the image. Um, this is back in my home country. This is in Scotland. And this is a, this is a field of barley, which is absolutely beautiful, lovely, lovely green, yellow color. But the sky also is really quite dramatic and quite quite um, astounding. So in this case, I've actually split 50-50 um, equally. So given each aspect of that, then something to look at. Similarly here, this is a rather strange looking photograph when you understand what it is. This is actually taken in the Rio de la Plata estuary in Argentina as we were going up in a boat. And um, it's a very, very muddy estuary. So the lower half is just the muddy estuary and the upper half is the, is the striated sky, which I thought made a rather abstract photograph. It's also good to think about framing your image and use things round about you as natural frames. This, this photograph was taken in Norway. This is a, in the Norwegian fjords. And I actually used one of the large side windows of the ship we were on as a frame to direct your eyes towards the beautiful view up the fjord. Uh, here's a very well-known landmark, uh, the Opera House in Sydney, obviously, but taken slightly differently again from the ship and through that um, aperture through the side of the, the, the ship's wall, which kind of frames that um, lovely structure in a slightly different way. This photograph was uh, taken in the entrance to 
the Parliament building in Quebec in Canada. And to get inside the Parliament, you had to go through an underground escalator. And as you went down, there was this beautiful circular window, which to me just offered a great opportunity as a lovely frame to look at the, the building taken from inside and uh, just framed the, the building really quite nicely. So it's very useful to use, like the photograph on the, the left here is a window frame looking out into the bay uh, in a coastal village in Scotland, or use natural parts of a historical monument on the right arches, provide lovely frames that you can use to then look through to your actual subject. So think about that when you're taking photographs of, of, of how to frame it, how to compose it, and use these different framing options. Sometimes you have a, a very, very large, wide um, image you want to capture. This, this is a very interesting bookstore, actually. It's an old uh, opera house, which was converted into a bookstore. This is in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And to capture this, um, you've got, there's a couple of options. You can use a very wide angle lens. Um, but in this occasion, I think I did use a wide angle lens, but what I ended up doing was taking about four or five different separate images and then blending it together into a large panorama to really give you the, the depth uh, and the panoramic view of this magnificent, um, magnificent store. It's also very, very important to look at the details. You know, everybody is interested in taking photographs of the, the large objects, the panoramas, the landscapes. Don't forget to look at the very, very small details. This is a small door in a temple in Tibet and shows some beautifully intricate um, weaving work that was done and hung on the door. So it's always good to look at the small details as well as the large uh, panoramas and landscapes. Here's another um, very typical tourist view. I'm sure most of you might recognize this. This is Machu Picchu. And this is your standard tourist photograph, which of course I took as well, of Machu Picchu with all the tourists. I think what I'd like to um, instill into you as well is to think about different locations to take your photograph from. You don't want to take photographs that everybody else has. That's just boring. You need to try and think of a slightly different um, location or angle to take your photograph from to really grab attention. And this is Machu Picchu as well, but taken from a completely different angle. Uh, if I just go back, sorry, if you look at the, the top of this peak here, that I'm just circling with the mouse up there. That's where I walked to. We trekked up that um, very, very steep mountain and managed to get a fantastic aerial view of Machu Picchu. So it's, it's really well worth um, taking the effort, getting yourself into a completely different location and being able to take photographs that not many other people have managed to take. Um, let's talk a little bit about the angle and position that you take photographs. This is, um, this is a local scene taken up in um, Penang, uh, Georgetown. This is the um, Blue Mansion in Georgetown, a beautiful old building. And here we see a lovely, fairly straight photograph taken inside showing the lovely blue colored walls, an absolutely beautiful um, spiral staircase running up to the next level and a lovely light. Very nice photograph, but think about taking a slightly different angle. Go up the stairs, and here we've got a completely different um, aspect of that spiral staircase, uh, creating a much more artistic and visually appealing image. And it's funny, every time, every time I look at my photographs, I'm always thinking about, well, how could I have taken that slightly better? And as I was flicking through this, earlier today, I looked at this one and I thought, if only I'd waited or had somebody sitting on that seat down there, it would have actually just touched that photograph off perfectly. 
always good to consider how you can improve things. Always good to look up as well as down. And here we see an example of um, a photograph taken at the base of an extremely tall tree in Tasmania, a gigantic tree. And um, if you use the angle of looking directly up from the base of the tree to really emphasize uh, the size of that tree and create a much um, better impact. Here we see a very um, familiar site, I'm sure, for most of you, Petronas Towers. This, this photograph was actually taken many, many years ago, and it's a standard photograph of the Petronas Towers. And as always, as a photographer, when you're trying to take a photograph of a tall building, you've got a wide angle lens, and even with that, you have to um, actually angle your camera upwards uh, to take that photograph. And when you do that, you get the whole image, you get the whole structure in there. But as you can see here, everything appears to be sloping away. It's just the, the nature of the, the wide angle lens creates that effect of the, the buildings looking as though they're falling over backwards. So to get over that, um, what we do, and this example here shows how we can eliminate that effect by um, using a perspective correcting tilt shift lens. And this is a photograph taken in this, much the same area. And you can see here we've retained all the verticals of the buildings, which is, which is obviously more realistic. Um, also good to consider um, looking at a subject of taking it from many different angles and locations. Uh, here's four examples of a, a very famous landmark in Scotland. This is the Fourth Bridge, very close to my hometown. And here we see four completely different photographs taken of that bridge from four completely different angles. So it's very, very good to explore all of those different angles and locations and create some completely different images, uh, which will hopefully give you a lot higher impact. We'll talk a little bit now about creating, what I say, creating depth and layers to fill the frame. Um, when you're looking at a frame through the, through the camera, as I said, it's good to simplify it, but it's also good to build up a number of things in that frame to create layers and fill that frame to really attract the eye through the particular frame that you're showing. This is, this is an example taken in Yosemite, National Park, California, in the States. And I think this, this really demonstrates a whole number of layers. We've got a lovely path in front of us with a, a little wooden fence, and that's kind of leading you into the picture, and it leads the eye in. We've got somebody walking in front. We've got a beautiful textured uh, tree on the right-hand side, which captures your attention, trees on the left. And then as you go through that frame, almost in a three-dimensional manner, you actually see the, the distant um, scenery in the mountains in the distance. So we've really created a three-dimensional effect of creating a number of layers. And it's good to consider that when you're um, taking a photograph. Similarly, this image was taken in Canada at um, Kinney Lake in Mount Robson Provincial Park, uh, British Columbia. And again, here we've got a beautiful lake really quite remote, it took quite a trek to get there. And we've got these stunning mountains with beautiful colored trees on either side, leading you into the end of the lake with mountains in the background. And um, importantly as well, I've positioned the camera with this large um, tree trunk in the water at the front, really to capture the foreground attention. So your eye is kind of led into the picture from the tree trunk and then it goes into the lake and you're guided all the way through to the back to the beautiful mountains and then the, the, the beautiful sky above. So you're creating a, a three-dimensional layered image. Sometimes you take an image which is very, very bland. This is taken in Vietnam and just of the sea. And it would be a very bland image, but it's it's good to use foreground objects, such as, in this case, uh, a no swimming sign, to really capture our attention. 
and at least highlight the background as well. Similarly, this one was taken uh, again in Death Valley uh, in the USA, in California. And um, again, it uses a little bit of a humorous sign as well to attract your attention uh, with a lovely background as well. Getting close to your subject, I think, is very, very important, particularly with um, portrait work and dealing with people. Uh, I, like many people, are always very nervous of um, approaching people to take their photographs. It is a bit nerve-wracking. You need to get over that. And I found it is very important to get close to your subject. Um, this this photograph here was taken many years ago. I did a little project in um, Cambodia about the, the poor orphan situation there. And um, had the opportunity there to meet many of these orphans uh, out in many different locations. And had to get obviously extremely close to try and capture some of these images. And the best way to do that is to actually speak to these people, speak or communicate, get to know them, get their confidence, and then you can hopefully capture something uh, of how they're feeling. And I think these photographs here capture that entirely because I've got this little boy's total attention. You're close, you can capture a great photograph. Similarly, this, this guy, this is a trishaw rider up in um, Penang and uh, we used him one day. He was a very jovial character and he was more than happy to have a chat and I got extremely close to him and got, uh, got a tremendous close-up photograph. Obviously you can do the same with animals. This was a husky dog with incredible blue eyes I took in um, Alaska and this wonderful lady who was um, in the Easter parade in New York City when I was there quite a few years ago. And it's good to be able to get up close and be confident enough to capture those close photographs. This, this, this old lady was um, at a temple in Kathmandu. And uh, it was probably one of the very, very few occasions I've actually given money to somebody to get a photograph of them. I'm usually totally against that. But this old lady was extremely difficult to take a photograph of. And anyway, she was sitting at the temple and she was looking for some, some money anyway. So I very kindly gave her a donation and she was quite happy then to relax a bit and allowed me eventually to take a photograph, which ended up being a really nice photograph, I think. This, this old man... Um, this is quite an interesting story. This was taken in Tibet. I did a wonderful overland trip to Lhasa. It was by train to Lhasa and then overland by car from Lhasa up to, up to the base camp um, of Everest on the Tibet side. And we stopped one day at a very, very small village for lunch. And it was very, very basic. And we went in uh, to grab some lunch and all my group was sitting around the table ordering their noodles or their rice and there was there was no space for me at the table at that point when i because i'd been taking photographs outside and when i walked in there was another table and this old man was sat there and he was sat there in a stunning hat uh very well dressed uh incredible face and just a real character and I just decided I was going to make friends with this guy. So I sat down next to him. I couldn't talk with him because we couldn't communicate, but we managed through sign language uh, to order a few beers together. And um, we had some drinks and I got to know this guy and he was very happy then to allow me to take some pictures of him. And I got some fantastic close-up photographs of this guy in a restaurant situation, uh, simply because I took the time to spend some time and speak to this guy. And obviously had to have a few beers with him as well, as you can see here. Um, while taking photographs, it's always good to remember all some of the smaller details while you're looking at things, things like lines, shapes, symmetry, textures, patterns, colors, shadows, colors and reflections and we'll, I'll give you a, a few examples of that here. This is a 
close-up of uh, a sand dune, which obviously uh, ends up being a, a lovely abstract photograph when you look at the details. Um, lines can be very useful and interpreted differently in different compositions, as we see here in a, this is a church in um, San Francisco, and beautiful colored lights which were strung down from the ceiling. Patterns in nature as well can be extremely attractive and very, very useful in your photographs. So it's good to be aware of natural patterns uh, and symmetry, symmetry and color. And this, this, this picture here, this image was taken in Rongbuk Monastery, um, just very close to the base camp of Everest in Tibet. And an uh, incredible old monastery, which they were actually still working on while we visited. And this had just been painted. So with beautiful colors, uh, textures and symmetry as well. So I think the colors and symmetry here really, really make this photograph. Similarly here, this is um, uh, fields in Tasmania, um, showing some wonderful patterns and colors and gives you some leading lines taking you through to the, the background landscape. This particular photograph was taken in Scotland and again we're using leading lines. The fence running from the bottom left leads the eye into the middle of the photograph and out into the scenery and then up to the, the beautiful sky above. So it's good to consider these natural objects, maybe a line of trees, a fence, pillars, can help you in constructing a very nice photograph. Textures as well, particularly, I mean, you'll see this a lot in trees. You'll get some incredible textures and it's good to get close-ups of those. You'll see the colors of the, the tree bark, the, the fungus that's growing on it. This is a, a, a man-made stone wall in the far north of Scotland. And here again, we see some wonderful textures and colors contrasting with that bright blue sky. Colors as well here, this was taken in Vietnam, a whole lot of uh, ceramic um, bowls that have been made, but really highlighting a high variety of colors. And similarly, again, taken in Vietnam, um, some wonderful colorful light. So it's good to capture all that detail uh, of the colors and patterns as you're um, putting your photograph together. This is a photograph where I've actually isolated one single color. Um, this was an old abandoned building. It's gone now. This was right in the middle of KL um, for many, many years. And it was part of an old car park. And going inside that building was quite interesting to see and when I entered the building, there was this um, um, red umbrella, a bright red umbrella sitting right in the middle of the floor. So it made a, a great um, focal point for me in the photograph. And I decided in the post processing to basically isolate that color and make the rest of the, the photograph black and white. Again, creating a little bit more of an impact. This, this photograph here was taken in a... Um, orphanage in Cambodia and it's quite interesting from many different aspects if you really look at the details of this photograph it highlights a number of different things we've just talked about we've talked about symmetry we've talked about lines um, I've not mentioned yet but it's also good you see the, the two little guilds here um, in the background you've got direct eye contact with them they're looking at the camera We've got the girl in the front, she's out of focus, but um, it, the symmetry is beautiful with her in the middle, the two girls in the background, and we've got reflections as well going on. So there's a whole number of things happening in that photograph that really bring it together and creates a much, much higher impact photograph. Here's another one that shows reflections. This is a penguin taken in the Falkland Isles, and this little guy was... <laughs> He was wading out of the sea and it was quite amusing to watch him look down and he was admiring himself as he came out onto the beach. And I think that made quite a nice photograph with both him and his reflection. So reflections are a very, very useful tool to use. 
and you can use that in a whole number of different ways. Um, here's another example. This, this, is, this is my mother. Uh, she was taking a photograph on her iPad from a ferry in Scotland, the far north of Scotland. So I managed to capture a photograph of her taking a photograph and framed the photograph in such a way such that I got her reflection uh, in the iPad. So you get a you get a, the, you get the back of my mother, and you can also see her face. So it's quite interesting. Here's one where I've actually captured myself. This this um, this guy, he was our guide uh, in Nepal. We also trekked in Nepal up to the Everest, or halfway up to the Everest base camp in Nepal. And this was our, our guide who's wearing these reflecting sunglasses. And I managed to get a great photograph of him. But you'll see also I managed to capture myself in the reflection as well. So another useful technique there of using reflections. This photograph here, again, is of Petronas Towers. Everyone's taken photographs of Petronas Towers. But this photograph is not a direct photograph of the towers. This is a photograph using a reflection in, um, in fact, this is the British Council um, Malaysia building, which is directly opposite. So using the reflected glass in that building to help capture the, the image of the towers. Timing uh, is extremely important in photographs. Um, this photograph here highlights um, one aspect of that. This is a little cafe in, um, in Vietnam. It's a nice little photograph. We've got a lovely yellow wall. We've got a couple of people sitting having their lunch or their breakfast. And it's a nice photograph. But if you just wait a little time, somebody will come by. And if you get the right person, straight away when you see this picture, it's much the same image. But we know straight away this is Vietnam. We've got a lovely Vietnamese lady in her traditional ao dao. And as a bonus, we've got a Vietnamese dog. This is an image, again, taken in a small back street in um, China. And um, it's an interesting little street. But just waiting for the right moment, I waited till this lady came down to create a little bit more of an attention and something to focus on in the picture rather than just a, a boring street photograph. So timing, it's always good to maybe find a good frame find a nice picture, and then just wait there. Wait for the right moment. Wait for somebody to come into that picture, something to happen, and you'll get a much better image in the end. Of course, um, you need to be ready in many instances to grab a very fast photograph, fast shutter speed so you can freeze the action of people jumping. Um, or in this case, here we see a water spout in um, Tasmania. This used an extremely fast shutter speed, so we we captured all those incredible water droplets being thrown up from the spout. And in contrast to that, we can also use the opposite of that. We can use an extremely slow shutter speed, uh, putting your camera on a tripod, uh, opening the shutter for a much longer period, and capturing some movement. That could be the movement, in this case, of waterfalls or rivers, and it softens the water and creates a much more impressive photograph in the end. Similarly, this is um, taken with a relatively slow shutter speed where I've panned the camera. This is a, a tram in Prague, and I've actually focused on the tram, used the slow shutter speed, and panned alongside the tram as it moved past me and it creates this lovely blurred background, but we can still see the people in focus sitting on the, on the tram. So at this point, um, I'm going to take a two minute break. I believe um, uh, Jason or Simpson are going to say a few words, and then we're going to come back and I'll do a second portion to finish up the presentation. So over to you guys. Hey, thanks, Stuart. I love the sharings that you're sharing about the uh, Japanese geisha that you share. Be prepared to break the rules once you learn the basics. So 
It's really creative shots for me. I really love it. Uh, so, uh, what you learn about this, Simpson? Uh, do you learn about uh, any interesting part from the sharing just now? Well, to me, I was amazed at the number of photos he has, uh, Stuart has shared. And uh, it's just like traveling, traveling around the world, telling stories through photographs. And just like uh, one of our viewers, uh, Sin Yin Chang, she mentioned, uh, well, nice photos, pictures can tell a story. It is true, very true, amazing. Oh, thank you, Stuart, for that. Yeah, I saw this photo, um, like the Canada Lakes and the Machu Picchu, it just makes me feel like I'm go I, I want to travel after this MCO. It's just so nice and so uh, stunning. I, what I can say. <laughs> yeah, very true. So, yeah. So I see that some few people and no, uh, new joiners uh, to join the live stream. So we are Green Green Scout. Uh, if you have any, any interested uh, questions and any queries uh, for Stuart, you may leave your question in the comment box below and we'll go through it in the Q&A session. All right, and also to those who are new to Green Drinks, uh, Green Drinks Cal is an informal networking session for those uh, environmental conscious people. So that, I mean, um, it is a platform for us to be together and, and just learn together. So if you have any like uh, topics or team that interests you, uh, you can always like let us know, PM us in uh, Green Drinks KL, in Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, our website, all this, all right? So, um, well, today our, uh, our, what is it? our team today is impactful photogra photography. So, well, perhaps you want to, um, uh, Stuart, I, I hope you are, I mean, uh, you're, you're fine with your, your break. Perhaps uh, we, we can't wait for your next sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we carry on? Sure, let's do it. Okay, right, let's do this. I'll go to the full screen again. Um, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit, uh, really in concept, context with environmental photography, is just show you a few examples of some of the work I've done over the many, many years, which will maybe highlight some of that. And I'm going to touch on each of those. I mean, environmental can really, it covers many different aspects. It could be the human aspect. We could be looking at wildlife or nature. Um, actual physical landscapes. We could be talking about conservation. Pollution is obviously a very important one, one that's talked about very, very often. Climate change, huge subject that everybody talks about now. But as well as that, environmentally, we can look back at historical um, architecture and historical civilizations and see how the environment has impacted them and architecture as well. And one last thing, and I'll touch on that at the end of this next section, is, is the actual environmental impact of photographers themselves. <laughs> so let's, let's just, and I'm just going to flick through this. Uh, I'm not going to go through in a great deal of detail. Uh, but pictured here is there's a number of different projects. Uh, these are little projects that I've done really in relation to what I call the human factor. And um, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but um, I'll, I'll touch on maybe one or two of them. The first one uh, is a project I did, which was entitled Heartache and Hope, and was in relation to the orphans of Cambodia. And th this was a project I did mm, way back in 2007. It was really the the first time I had an opportunity to start doing really kind of documentary photography, and I did a, a documentary photography workshop with um, Gary Knight and Philip Blenkinsop of the Seven Photo Agency, uh, and this was carried out in Siem Reap in Cambodia. And the topic of my little project was the orphans of Cambodia, and really trying to highlight um, the situation they were in, because there's the, there's still a large number of orphans there, and looking at the aspect of how difficult their life was, but also looking at 
the orphanages and how they actually um, improve the life of these orphans. And these are just some of the images I took way, way back in 2007 on the streets of Seam Reap. And it's, uh, it's extremely sad when you see these orphans in these, these poor situations living on the street, uh, sleeping on the street, uh, begging and rummaging around rubbish bags for anything they can get. And um, this little orphan I met was out at one of the temples selling postcards and bracelets to the tourists there and managed to get a few photographs of them close up. Again, this is another couple of girls there that were selling trinkets and uh, postcards to the, to the tourists there in Cambodia. Very sad situation. And as you walk the streets during the day and in the evening, you would see these orphans out there rummaging around trying to find something to make a little bit of money and get some food for. But it was an incredible project and in that, um, you know, really enlightened me of how happy some of these kids were. And then actually visiting the orphanages during that time and seeing how the wonderful work that these orphanages did to basically teach these children some of the basics, give them some computer training, um, teach them about dance, uh, and obviously they were well fed as well. So it was a really nice opportunity to uh, look at this situation and see how their lives had improved dramatically. I think this, this, this picture here really kind of summed up to me. This was a, a group of children inside the school getting the lesson and this poor orphan was outside looking in jealously wishing that he was in there getting a lesson with them. So just a few images of that project. This, this is, here's a couple of other images done. This was done in Bali where um, I did a little project on some of the rice fields that um, are, you, you see all over central Bali and particularly around Ubud. And this incredible gentleman I met in the rice fields, I don't know how old he was, but he was out there working away. And it's really nice to get close-ups of these people in their environment, working the fields. And um, this was just such an uh, enlightening project to do in meeting these people in, in their own environment. Wonderful people. And you ended up getting some great photographs. Using, in this occasion, an extremely simple setup. Um, I'd actually been out days before with all my camera lenses in a huge bag and just got tired of carrying that. And I went out this day into the rice fields with a very simple, small lens, one single lens, and I managed to get all these fantastic photographs. So again, it emphasizes the point that um, you don't need all the equipment. You need a simple setup, one that you're comfortable with, one that you can move around easily with, and you can still capture some fantastic images. Um, Wildlife and nature, again, there's many environmental considerations there. Um, in Cambodia and, and many of the temples, you'll see these incredible fig trees and other trees growing through the structures. This is the, the Ta Prom Temple in Cambodia. And I managed to do a little project there and put together a nice sequence of photographs of these incredible trees. Uh, in the Taprom tem Ta Temple. And I decided on this occasion to actually finish processing these images in black and white, which I think really highlighted the, the structure and the texture and the details of these trees. Quite a number of other projects I've done, which you could kind of um, term under landscape. There's links over here on the left. Um, if anybody wants these, we can make those available to people. You can you can see many of these projects on my um, my personal blog, and I'm sure that's um, being shown in the bottom of the screen at some point. So feel free to go to that blog, uh, highlanderimagesphotography.com, and you'll see many many sets and sequences of projects and photographs that I've taken in many different areas. 
and hopefully that might well give you inspiration. Talking about conservation, a couple of things I'll just highlight. I'm sure many of you will know this guy. This is probably one of the first little projects I did a long time ago now with uh, Eco Warriors in Malaysia. Um, everybody will know this guy, Matthias. And um, we did this fantastic project of where we were uh, regenerating um, a peat swamp, peat swamp forest and replanting it with tree with, with tree and sprouts. Uh, Conservation-wise as well, I think I'd like to highlight this particular area. This was a fantastic um, visit I made to um, China and. Um, this fantastic park, and uh, just trying to remember the name of it, um, Jujigo, and um, they've got this incredible natural park here with stunning scenery, as you can see. But they've done a really great job conservation-wise because they want to protect the beautiful environment, and they've created wooden walkways all through this park, which all the visitors are restricted going on so that really gives one a great opportunity for the masses of Chinese tourists that go through this area to see this beautiful area and it has a very very low impact on the environment so you can see just how beautiful this area is but um, the Chinese have done an incredible job of protecting that beautiful environment as you can see again you see these beautiful clear lakes, crystal clear lakes, um, crystal blue waters, and then stunning scenery all the way around. And you can see in the background there, all the, the wooden walkways that allow the visitors to walk around these incredible bits of uh, scenery. Um, pollution is another topic, uh, environmental topic. And um, I've seen many examples of pollution all over the world. Just touching a couple of those, um, uh, seen many um, glaciers receding over many, many years. This is the Franz Josef Glacier in New Zealand. And you've now got to walk quite a few kilometers up the valley till you actually reach the front of that glacier. So in many, many areas around the world, we see these glaciers receding. This is taken at the top of um, the Fox Glacier, right next to Franz Josef Glacier. I had the luckily opp opportunity to take a helicopter up to the top where we got these incredible views of the, the top of the glacier. This is a glacier, the Amelia Glacier in Chile. Again, just an incredible sight, but really uh, a very much smaller glacier than it was many, many years ago. Um, this was a lucky one, an uh, interesting photograph. Um, we were taking a, a cruise around South America, and just after visiting the Falklands, we were steaming north to Argentina, which was a two or three day um, steam. And I thought there's going to be nothing to see for two or three days. I basically put my camera away and just relaxed until the captain announced one day that there was something everybody had to see and he diverted about seven or eight kilometers to see a bit closer and this was a gigantic iceberg from antarctica which was <laughs> heading north and um, it was just absolutely incredible to see the structure out in the middle of the uh, south atlantic a little bit closer to home i did a little mini project myself on um, the rivers in kl um, looking at how polluted they were. Obviously, we're, you've probably heard of the, the River of Life project, which has attempted in some ways to clean up this environment. Uh, they've done that to a certain extent, but I'm sure we could do a lot more there. Um, this was me. This was a selfie taken um, down, actually right down in the river itself. And as I said before, you've got to be prepared to get yourself into different locations and maybe sometimes slightly more dangerous situations to get the photograph that you want to take to create the impact and the image that you want to show. 
climate change, as we know, is happening all over, and um, we've seen a lot of the forests around KL being slowly cut away. Um, luckily, we've still got Bukit Kiara, which is known as the Green Lung. I did a little project on that. And we've got the Kota Damansara Forest Park, which is well worth a visit if you've not been there. Talking a little bit about historically and how maybe how that would affect our view of the environment. Um, I've done a lot of work in Cambodia and did a fairly large project on all the temples in and around Siem Reap and further north in Cambodia. And one of my books I created, and uh, you'll see the, the title page there on the right, Lost Cities of the Angkor Empire. And it's really all about the ancient Khmer Empire, which was very prevalent um, way back in the 10th century. And when you realize the complexity and the size of that civilization back then, and due to environmental changes, simply disappeared, leaving these incredible temple complexes all over Cambodia. And this is just um, a few of the photographs of that. I'm sure many of you have been there but when you actually study um, about the civilization, what happened back then, it really is much more incredible. And it makes us realize that in some cases, even an advanced civilization, as the Khmer civilization was back then, can simply disappear due to environmental changes. Effectively, what happened there was uh, they were very dependent on the monsoon rains. There was a period of about seven years of drought and um, they just couldn't control the water, which obviously provided the nutrition for all their crops and the civilization eventually just disappeared, which was quite sad. But well worth visiting that um, incredible location all over Cambodia. A uh, little bit local information here i did a little project on the architecture of um, malaysia just touching on some of the disappearing architecture and i'm sure you've all seen this um, you've seen incredible developments in kl and the rest of malaysia over the last 10 20 years and a lot of the old buildings are simply disappearing and this was my attempt to try and capture these um, before they went for good. This, this, this was taken up in um, Ipo, lovely old building. Um, this is the Blue Mansion in Penang. Uh, again, luckily that's still there and has been preserved, uh, which is an incredible bit of architecture. Um, this is gone, this is, a, this is an old school in Penang, uh, a wonderful old school. And unfortunately that has now disappeared and that area has been redeveloped. This is a building in KL, um, very close to town, Wisma Ekran, lovely old piece of architecture. And this is the famous old Cop Dior um, restaurant, uh, which was used to sit right in the middle of town, right next to Petronas Towers. And I knew they were going to be demolishing that, so luckily I got down there and managed to capture a few images of that before that beautiful old structure actually disappeared. And of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the Pudu Jail, which again was totally redeveloped. And I think they, they've still left the gate there, but most of the other, all of the other structures have gone. So I spent about a day or two taking meticulous photographs of all the beautiful murals and paintings along all of the walls just to actually record that. This, um, this is another old set of buildings. And again, that is gone now. And um, this was right in the middle of KL, wonderful old houses. And I managed to stitch together a whole number of photographs to create that incredible montage of these old houses in central KL. Just to touch on another subject, um, environmental impact of photographers. And I think this, this photograph here really sums up that particular concern of mine. And this is obviously Angkor Wat in Cambodia. 
and you go there, it's a it's a extremely popular tourist site. This was just a, at dawn or just after dawn. Everybody goes there to capture dawn photographs of Angkor Wat. And there's just thousands, hundreds of people all thronging there, all wanting to capture the same photograph. So you have this huge impact of people in these um, types of environment that potentially can cause damage. So it's particular, particularly concerning of me uh, to protect and sustain these types of environments. So it's, it's good to plan ahead of where you're going. A lot of these areas you go into, uh, wilderness areas or architectural areas, are very sensitive. So it's good to respect that environment and the wildlife that is there. And the old adage of leave it as you found it. Leave absolutely no trace. Don't leave your rubbish. Um, try and stick to the dedicated paths and dispose of all, all your rubbish and, and take that with you. Planning and execution of a photo shoot. I'd just like to um, mention a little bit about this, uh, how you'd actually do that. And I think it's very important before you start a story, uh, put a number of photographs together into a story, is sketch out your photo story. You can do it in your head or do it on a bit of paper and work out and list what photographs you're going to need to make that story. Because the last thing you don't want is to go out, take a whole number of photographs and then come back to put together your story or your article or your blog and then realize you've forgotten one particular aspect that you should have taken and you end up having to go back there and take some more photographs. So it's good to research your subject, um, look at other photographs, obviously, to uh, people have taken in that area to give you inspiration. Um, don't copy those photographs, though. Uh, don't copy exactly what they've done. It's good to get inspiration, but I think it's very important to do your own interpretation of your story and create something a little bit differently. Logistics of getting there, travel, visa, permits, all the usual things, accommodation, um, that's almost impossible these days. Uh, it's difficult normally, but in these COVID days, um, I don't know how we're going to do that till things get better. But I think one thing I would recommend is get a local guide, uh, somebody that can fix things, somebody that can take you places that you might know about, give you different locations and um, just help you with the local language, uh, etc. Very, very useful. It's also good to consider what time of day you're going to go there. Um, are you going to go to Anchor Wat at, at dawn or are you going to go there at sunset? Um, you know, decisions to be made. And obviously the time of the year as well is very, very important um, of where you visit an area. And you've got to research that depending on the weather um, conditions at that time. Choose your photograph, your, your equipment uh, wisely. And I, I, I try to stress, minimize your kit. You don't want to be carrying a whole bunch of stuff with you and fumbling around and changing lenses and try to keep it to the bare minimum, keep it simple. And I found that works the absolute best. And this last item I think is, is quite important. And I've been caught out many times in the past. Take, take, what I say here is take your time on site when you're taking your photographs. Ensure you have all the images. Um, normally when I go around and I'm taking a whole set of photographs at location and I think I've got everything, I don't just pack up and go. I usually wait a little while. I'll take another walk around uh, and just wait because something else will crop up. Something will crop up that you would have missed. So do take your time. You've taken all that effort to get to that location. So take your time and you will be um, pleasantly surprised by maybe an additional photograph that you would never have got. A little bit about post-processing publishing. Uh, I saw some comments coming in in the questions about post-processing. My philosophy is don't overdo it. Really keep it as simple as possible. Um, I really concentrate on just the basics, making sure your exposure is okay, a little bit of contrast adjustment, uh, saturation perhaps, 
white balance is important to get correct and you can do some of that in post processing if you've taken raw photographs rather than just jpegs and then balancing out the highlights and the shadows straighten horizons this is a simple thing but there's nothing more annoying than looking at a lovely photograph of a sea or a lake and the it's not level and everything seems to be sliding off uh, straighten your horizons crop your photograph where necessary i usually try and frame my photograph that i've got everything in frame when i'm taking it but sometimes you miss something there'll be something that will catch your eye and it's just annoying so you can crop that out in post processing and then sometimes or usually i spend a little bit of work in post processing and enhancing areas of interest um, you know maybe masking some areas putting some linear gradients on masks on the sky because in many occasions the sky might be extremely bright and you've got shadows in the foreground and you need to try and balance that out so it's important to get that right and then at the end you can add a little bit of clarity and just sharpen that photograph up ready for publishing so for publishing you need to consider um, where you're publishing your photograph are you just going to do it on your on your blog on facebook or do you need some high resolution images for print or publishing and there's different requirements for all of those so you will need smaller resolution web size images for social media and maybe high resolution tiff images or high resolution jpegs for print or for publishing if you're going to publish books or for magazine or newspapers it's very good to consider a dedicated website or in many cases now a lot of people have their dedicated blog to showcase your images uh, but there's many many photo hosting sites out there now which are really really excellent in comparison to what we had many years ago we've got sites like smart mug we've got Flickr, 500 px there's google apple adobe image chat photo bucket a whole host of those so really a, a fabulous choice of, of where you can actually publish your photographs now. And of course, we've got social media. We can't get away from that. And everybody wants to publish on that. And that's extremely easy to do. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the rest. And then obviously book publishing. Um, if you want to go to print Apple Books to um, a good job, or you could do Amazon Kindle. And I've dabbled a little bit of that during the lockdown from last year i sat down and decided i was going to test that out and ended up publishing about 20 books online both on apple books and amazon so it's once you get the process worked out it's relatively easy and it's extremely satisfying a little bit about some tips and tricks about my philosophy um, as i said before get a storyline that you want to do focus on that work out how you want to put that together have an idea before you go out blindly shooting it's important to get out of your comfort zone and get into different areas where you would never imagine you'd be um i mean being brought up in a small little town in scotland many many years ago i would never imagine myself now heading into um, poor villages in Indonesia, remote locations in China, Tibet, Cambodia, uh, working with orphans in Cambodia. It's just been incredible. It's a great experience. So it's good to try and get out of your comfort zone. And as I mentioned before, get close to people, talk to them, speak to them, get to know them. And that way you'll get a far better photograph. Make eye contact with them. And as you speak to them, they're looking at you, you'll be able to capture a photograph with them directly looking into the camera, which ends up being a much better and a much higher impact photograph. So I can't emphasize enough, it's good to know your subject. People doing street photography, and I know I was guilty of this as well, is sneaking around with big lenses and trying to capture images from a distance. Yes, you can do that, but you will get much more satisfying images using a, a small, wide-angle, normal lens. Get up to people and don't 
just start taking photographs, walk up to them and talk to them, get to know them, sit and have a coffee with them. Or like that old man in Tibet, I sat and had quite a few beers with them and it was wonderful. And I got to know him and I got some tremendous photographs with, with, for him. Develop your own style. Um, very important to do that. Um, it's not good to copy other people. Yes, get inspiration, but it's focus on your own style and how you want to project your images. Composition, as I said before, try to get different perspective of angles. Don't take the same photograph everybody else is taking and take your time, look again. Um, framing we talked about earlier, uh, focus on the point of interest, try to fill that frame with a number of interesting things, combine those elements to create depth in your photograph, to create layers and try and exclude anything that you really don't want in that photograph, exclude clutter. And then be creative, try to do something a little bit different. Look at reflections, try to look at, consider symmetry, the lines, colors, uh, look at where the shadows are. Are there any shapes that are important you can use in your photograph, textures, patterns, and then movement, very important to try and capture movement and consider that in your photograph. And then of course, there's the usual photography rules, which you know, you'll read about in photography books. And I'm not going to touch on that, really. You can read about that. In terms of equipment, um, it's very good and important, I think, to check and double check and preset your camera. Make sure you've got everything ready because you don't want to be in a location where something happens and sometimes something will happen extremely quickly that you want to capture uh, and you want to be ready for that. So be familiar with your camera so you can work it in the dark, you can work it with gloves in the cold and have backup material ready, batteries, extra memory cards and cleaning kit to keep your camera in tip top condition. And above all, keep it simple. I'm going to finish up with just a, a number of um, uh, quotes, which I think are quite appropriate for photography. And this first one is actually a golfing quote, but I think for photography, it's also very applicable. And this is from Gary Player, who's obviously a uh, professional golfer. And he quoted, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. And it's exactly the same for photography. You need to go out there and practice, practice, practice. Just keep taking photographs and then looking at them, reviewing them and working out how you can make them better. This was another very famous um, documentary news photographer many years ago in the States known as Ouija. His famous quote, which is classic, was F8 and be there. And I think that really simplifies things. Don't worry about all the settings in the camera. Fix your F-stop. F8 will cover most things and just be there in the location on the spot and get your image. This guy uh, is a National Geographic photographer, Michael Yamashita. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet him in Singapore a few years ago at a conference. Great guy, and, and he's got some fabulous for photography stories, really nice to listen to, great advice. And he said, his quote was, I'm paid to be lucky, and that means making your own luck. Getting yourself in the right position, in front of the right subject, at the right time and in the right light. And that really, really sums it up to me. So I'm gonna finish up with this one image here. And this, this image is, uh, this was taken at the Everest base camp or what was left of it on the Tibet side because they actually moved the base camp further up when we got there. And this is at a height of something like 5,000 meters. In the clouds there in the background, and you can't see it unfortunately because the clouds were down, is Mount Everest. Uh, and I show this photograph, I mean, it's a nice photograph, but the photograph was the easiest thing to take. The hardest thing was actually getting there. And I think it, that's the most thing I've stressed, the thing is, is make the effort to get into a different location, which might not be easy to get to, but you will get images that not many other people have had. 
And this was taken, um, I think, just a couple of years ago. And it took quite an effort to get there, but we've been there now. And here's just a selection of photographs showing me in various locations, uh, yeah. extreme locations in Iceland and um, various other places, South America, taking photographs. And there's one thing that struck me when I put this together was, I think in every single one of them, I'm wearing a red jacket. So maybe that's something else you should consider. <laughs> and again, just another couple of photographs of me on location. Uh, the right hand side one is me in um, Iceland and the one on the left is in Tibet on the way up, halfway up to Mount Everest. So a lot of people ask me, what's the most important piece of equipment you've got? Can you recommend a camera? a lens, just give me some advice. I'm going to leave you with one image now that's my best advice for all of you. And that's these. Get a good pair of boots and get yourself into a different location. Uh, it might be difficult to get to, but you'll end up having photographs with a much higher impact. So on that, um, I'm going to close and uh, I think we're going to have a few words from Jason or Simpson, are we? Hey, so thanks. Thanks for the uh, tips and tricks uh, you shared just now. I'm really inspired that you even have your own philosophy to share about. Like, we have to just get close to people, to talk up to people for the for the every photo taken and you have to stay on site to see and hunt for the best photo. I really love, love that. How about yeah. you, Simpson? Yeah, yeah very true. Yeah. And also, well, the gears is like get a pair of boots. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we have seen uh, it's almost the time and uh, we have still Q&A to go on, but today uh, there's a special event happening here. So we have a photography contest that held two, uh, two weeks ago. So we are excited to announce the winner. And today, uh, Josh will be Stuart Taylor himself. So yeah. Okay. yeah. Shall I announce the winner now? Sure, oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Um, we have quite a number of um, photographs being submitted, and thanks to everybody who sent those photographs in, and I've been through them. And here are the results. We have three winners. In third place, we have Izati. Whoa. So congratulations, Izati. Uh, she sent in... Um, a sequence of photographs with a lovely, lovely quote uh, from Franklin Roosevelt saying, a nation that destroys its soil, soils destroys itself. Forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. And this photograph really captured me, I think. I mean, everyone's seen sunset photographs, but sunsets are actually quite difficult to capture properly. And this one's been taken absolutely perfectly. Um, the, the sunset is beautiful, the clouds are stunning. Even the sea in the foreground, which is obviously even in the shadows, is there's a lot of detail there. And the horizon is straight. So she also sent in a couple of other photographs which highlights the forests, which actually go along with the court quite nicely. So third place goes to Izati. And Izati will receive a copy of my ebook. Uh, which is called Lost Legacy, and this ebook is all about the disappearing Malaysian architecture. And um, so that is the third prize that will go to Izati. Okay. So, uh, congrats, congrats, uh, Izati. So before we go into the second winner and the first winner, perhaps Simpson, do you want to uh, introduce about this photography contest? All right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right, so um, when we, I mean, back then when the uh, Green Drinks team, we were uh, discussing, uh, 
when we are, uh, I mean, when, when we are discussing about this, uh, this event, impactful photography, we we're thinking, hey, since uh, Stuart is uh, sharing to us about photography, why don't we just like have this uh, photography contest? So, well, if we have a photography, I mean, <laughs> if we have a photography contest, then Stuart can actually give some pointers on it on and how we can make it better. So the, the rules are very simple. Just post one to three photos in a uh, Facebook or Instagram and tag Green Ring Scale. That's it. Yeah, that's really simple. I I really uh, love the contest. It makes uh, Green Ring Scale to have uh, more uh, elemental uh, of type of event instead of the virtual live stream. So uh, the judging points for this uh, photo con contest is also very simple. It actually just based on the impactfulness that we are sharing all the time, whether is it powerful enough to gain the audience attention. And the next one will be the images qualities and the caption creativities. That's all for the judging points. And we would like the steward uh, come back to announce the second runner up and the first winner. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go on to the second place now. And the second place goes to Daniel Lim. And Daniel submitted a sequence of photographs, all to do really between uh, the relationship between nature and architecture, which I thought was quite a nice topic. And this photograph here, the first one, shows a beautiful example of that, of a tree being allowed to grow up through a structure. And another photograph showing a tree growing through a wall. And um, this last photograph was a lovely beachfront photograph, which is very, very nicely framed with the, the trees creating a, a lovely frame, um, a lot of activity going on right in the central part of the beach and going out to the sea. So a beautiful sequence of photographs from Daniel. So well done, well done, Daniel. And the second prize goes to Daniel, and he will receive my ebook, which is entitled The Roof of Borneo, which is all about a trip up to the top of Mount Kinabalu and um, photographs around Mount Kinabalu National Park. So well done, Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you. Daniel. And the first prize. Our winner. And our winner is in first place um, Tracy Gold. Well done, Tracy. Um, Tracy submitted a very interesting sequence of photographs. Um, luckily, I think Simpson or uh, Jason translated the Chinese into the quote which said, Small action makes great changes. Do not litter. It's everyone's responsibility to care for the environment. And I think this picture here really sums up that environmental issue. We've all seen this. Uh, we've seen a, got a beautiful environmental location here, and it's been totally ruined by this trash that's just been left in the foreground. And she's captured this image just nicely, balancing up the, the beautiful environment, but highlighting the problem of the trash right on the foreground in the beach. And similarly, our second photograph highlighting that also. There was another photograph taken. I don't know where this was actually located, but again, it highlights the problem we've all seen in uh, towns and cities where garbage is just thrown arbitrarily into drains and starts blocking drains. And this, this photograph is taken really quite nicely. She's taken a very low angle, put the camera down low to highlight all the garbage in the drain, but got it in context with all the houses as well. So well done, Tracy. And Tracy will, funny enough, get um, my ebook, which was done in Malaysia on all the graffiti, which we see all over KL and other areas. Uh, so Graffiti Malaysia ebook but will go to Tracy as first prize. So well done. And thank you to everyone else who submitted photographs. Okay. Oh, 
Amazing. That's really wonderful. I really like uh, Tracy's uh, photo hiding the the trash and the environment as well. It's so contrast. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So it's almost time for us to go into the Q&A session. So congrats to Tracy, Daniel, and Izati. So if you guys are on the live stream, maybe you can drop a comment to thanks to it or any further question you may ask in this live stream as well. Okay, uh, let's go to Q&A session. So yeah, just, just, before, uh, just before you do that, um, perhaps mm -hmm. I can ask um, you, Jason, or, or Daniel to um, send me the email addresses of those three winners so I can send them the, the e-books. Sure, right. no problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sweet. So right now, the first question that we're going to read through is uh, for Daniel. He said that uh, if I'm just an ordinary using an ordinary phone camera for the photography, any tips for capturing imaging photo? For example, setting up ISO, ISO, or set certain parameters to maximize quality. Uh, how's your opinions to it? I do a little bit of film photography, um, not a great deal, um, but I think these days most of the cameras you have in some of the modern phones are actually very, very good. Um, you don't have to do a lot of settings. Um, you mentioned ISO. Uh, in all circumstances where I can, I will keep ISO as low as possible. Uh, as I long see. as I'm still getting a reasonable shutter speed. Um, but in most cases, I would say to most people is, is don't worry about ISO because nowadays in most of the cameras and even a lot of the phones now, the, the high ISO performance is getting better and better. And it's only when you get into very, very low light situations that... Um, um some of these phone cameras will not do as well um but i think just just keep to the basics i think um framing all the things i talked about today i wouldn't overly um complicate things particularly if you're using a phone i mean when i'm using my phone camera i use an iphone and i'm using the iphone 11 and the photographs are very very good quality and it's all pre-processed for you and quite honestly, when I look at them finished, um, there's not a lot more I can do with them. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. And that goes as well for even many of the cameras. A lot of people, and I see one of, there's another question there about, yeah, what camera would you recommend for a beginner? These days, um, most cameras are actually very, very good. Get something that you are happy with is perhaps simple enough for you to operate and don't overly worry about it. Most of the quality coming out of most cameras now are very, very good. Concentrate on other things like some of the things I've talked about earlier this evening. Okay, thank you Stuart for your opinion. I, I think uh, I agree with you for the ISO that you need to uh, tune as low as possible because once you go uh, more than 10K of ISO, it will become so exposed and a, a lot of noise in the image, which mm -hmm. I don't really enjoy after I capture with high ISO feature. So mm, we can go to the next question. All right. Okay. I have a, I have a question from Tony Robinson. Uh, he asks, uh, are your projects typically done at the request of an organization? or made available to one after the fact uh, or are they typically things you are just interested in researching or identifying uh, and made available to the general public for education or awareness what i'm exploring is how to most effectively use one's photography as a change agent awesome. but yeah you're, you're you're traveling around the world and yeah well, i mean what well, was your motivation um I love taking photographs and um, when I actually um, put stories together, it motivate, motivates me even further. I have a focus. Um, most of my projects are all done personally. Um, I've done a few organization requests, 
projects or, or paid projects, but most of these uh, that I've talked about today are all just self-interest. There's something that captures my attention. I want to do a little project on that. And that's a great motivation, motivation for taking photographs is actually think of a subject that you're interested in or concerned about. It could be an environmental subject. It could be any kind of subject and work out how you're going to take photographs to put a story together. And that's what inspires me. And if you've actually got an end product in mind, and it doesn't necessarily need to be um, for a paid organization, uh, what I've done over the last few years now is when I put a blog together, I wanted to create stories on that blog to share information that I'm interested in. And that gives me great inspiration. And you get incredible feedback from people as well, which is really nice. And you'll hear from different people and get their different views. And uh, it's been very, very inspiring. So most of most of the work that I've done is all self-inspired. All right. I, I have a follow-up question. Um, is, um, well, how uh, is it, in, I mean, is it impactful? Do you, do you think? Uh, because what you have done is all like personal, uh, with your personal interest. So, is it impactful to change what you wanted to change, using uh, the power of one person? It's very difficult, <laughs> and I think <laughs> I think even people in the mainstream business, full time professional photographers that are doing that, find it extremely difficult. Um, to try and really get a story over, but it can be done, and it, and it just takes, as been highlighted earlier, it takes one or two images to do that of key events and, and being at the right time, the right place to capture that. There's quite a number of um, photographers that I keep in contact with um, that work for various agencies, and um, a couple of those guys were working in Washington during the, the capital um event that occurred and they were actually on site there taking photographs of that riot that was occurring and um it was really quite inspiring hearing directly from them how difficult it was in that situation and how they managed to capture their images but when you actually see some of these images um it's only then it can hopefully create some change but it does take a lot of effort and as I say, I don't do this professionally as a paid full-time photographer in journalism or documentary. I do it on a personal basis. But hopefully in my little way, um, maybe some of the things that I've created might change something. <laughs> wow, that's uh, amazing. And uh, yeah, I, I wish that, uh, well, with little things that we do, it, it does create a change. Yeah. Thank All you. right, Jason? Okay, uh, the next question from me is Jeffrey. So Jeffrey asks, uh, how can this firm of photo reach to the top 1% or the government who are controlling the world resources? A bit political for me. Uh, okay, resources are enough. Unfortunately, uh, the system makes it unevenly distributed. How can this video or photo really bring impact to people to contribute to others, especially for those who are influential and can make big decisions. How's your opinion for this? <laughs> a big, that's, too wide. That's a great question. And um, I think what's important there is, is not so much reaching the top percent of the government or whoever's controlling a particular country or situation. I think it's very important for photography to reach out to the general public because they are the masses that will eventually create an effect. And we've seen that in this country. We've seen that. You could go to the top 1% and nothing will happen. But when you get a particular story that is taken on by the general public en masse, and great deals of numbers, that's when we can have an incredible effect. 
Yes, yes, I totally agree with you, Stuart. I think uh, influence the mass is uh, changing the pyramid. So even the top 1% stay the top, but in the bottom, once it's uh, yeah. affected and influenced, maybe it can change the top 1% too. Yeah. I totally agree. And we've seen that happen in many different countries. Yes, yes, yes. It always All starts right. from... <laughs> now, now we're getting very political. I don't know if we're allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, perhaps one last question, uh, which sure. is, um, well, uh, Stuart, can you share us one ex uh, interesting experience you had well, throughout your, your journey of uh, this photography? Ah, okay. <laughs> I didn't show this in the presentation. I actually took it out because I was a bit worried about time. But let me, <laughs> can I go back to my screen and... Sure. Yep. Okay, you can see that. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Just bear with me. Okay, can you see that one? Yep. Right. Photography, I mean, this, this is a situation that brought me to a very surprising situation, and it was purely by chance. And this was a, an assignment I was actually asked to do for a newspaper. It was a newspaper out of Abu Dhabi. And I'd done some photographs from them before. And they asked me to cover an event happening in KL. And this was a, a Muslim ladies conference. I can't quite recall the name of it, but I was asked if I could take photographs at this event because um, they were, I think they're photographer, or anyway, they needed somebody to do that. So I eventually agreed to go along to this Muslim ladies conference, which was held in a conference center in the middle of KL and um, to take photographs and cover it. And I got these incredible photographs of some of these fabulous ladies attending this conference. And you, you'll see, there is one gentleman at the top here. He was actually the convener of this, um, particularly this, this conference. It was the Women's Islamic Initiative in something. And this particular gentleman, very, very interesting character. I think he was, I think he was from Kuwait originally, but that gentleman is the head imam in the New York mosque in New York City. And he, was, he convened this conference, and it was very, very interesting. And I went along, took photographs of all these ladies and all day, and then was basically wrapping up. And the lady from the newspaper who was, she was doing all the interviews, approached me at the end and said, Stuart, could you, could you do an extra photo shoot this evening? I said, well, what's this? Just, um, well, I've got an interview with the ex-prime minister of Malaysia. And I didn't know who she meant. Um, I thought it could have been, um, anyway, I didn't know which prime minister she was re referring to because that gentleman who organized the conference that was apparently knew this guy very well. So we were invited out to the ex prime minister's house for this lady to interview him and I was gonna take photographs. So next minute I was out at Putrajaya and um, sitting in the house of um, Pakla. Badawi and the lady sat there and interviewed him and I took photographs of him while we did this and then he invited us to dinner so we actually sat down in his house and I sat right next to Badawi and had a lovely local dinner with him at his house I had to call my wife and I told her very quickly I couldn't make it home for dinner and she said why not I said because I'm I'm having dinner with Badawi and she didn't believe me. <laughs> so that was that was um, a rather interesting situation I got into and um, something that just totally came out of the blue and it was just by luck I was in the right place at the right time. So I ended up at his house, but what a, what a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's interesting. I, I, I guess, uh, well, I, I, I can sum up these, uh, I mean, Stu's sharing by well, photographs is not just to show the beauty, but it's also to record history. And at the same time, you meet a lot of wonderful people and 
and these kind of interesting experiences. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. It's it's really wonderful, and uh, it's it's really wonderful that uh, you actually like bring us to travel around the world, especially during this COVID season. It's like wow, it is really wonderful. Thank you very much, Stuart. No All problem. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that wraps up our our uh, event today. All right. So yeah, Jason. Okay. Um. Thanks. So for. Uh, at this q and session, who haven't uh, go through for your question, no worries for that. We'll go through by commenting under your question, uh, question later. Uh, so today uh, is part for our uh, live So I would like to introduce every one of you uh, Green Drink Scout. Green Drink Scout is an informal uh, networking that gathers environmental uh, conscious people together. So we are a bi-monthly organization to help the live stream event and any physical event after the MCO is lifted. So we wish everyone to join our event in the future. So if you have any interest to see our past event, no, uh, you can join, uh, find in our YouTube. We have our recorded videos in the YouTube channel. And some of our um, blog also feature some of our uh, post event rise up. So you can uh, go for that. And let's go to Stuart. Uh, Stuart, do you have any shout out before we uh, wrap up? No, I just, again, no, I'd I just, like to thank you to all you guys, Simpson, Jason, and Zati for helping out. And everyone that's jumped in here and joined tonight, thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions. There's some more there. Um, you can check out my, the, my Instagram account is being listed there. I'm always posting things up there on a daily basis. Um, uh, as you mentioned, because of COVID, I'm not doing much traveling. So you'll see I'm bringing back images from quite a number of years ago. But it's always good to go back and, and revisit those, reprocess them, put some new life into them. Um, so please go and have a look. Leave comments. Get in touch with me. I've got no problem um, catching up with you, uh, giving some tips, advice, whatever. Oh, thanks very much, everyone. All right. Thank you very much, Stuart. And, uh, well, it's a, it has been a pleasure, a great pleasure uh, for, us to, uh, meet, for us to join you today. Thank you very much, Stuart. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. All right. Bye, Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. We end our live now. <laughs>